is the chair of the Geosciences Advisory Board, which is where our paths come. And he's also on the research and collaboration subcommittee of that advisory board. And so that's where we became aware of the work that he's been doing in terms of speaking to undergraduates about climate change on behalf of AAPG. And so when you were talking and you volunteered to do this talk, it was pretty much a natural fit. And so I'm really honored that you were able to do this. It was fortuitous that he was in, in town for geosciences and U of A um, Dean of Science business, basically. So with that, I'll let you talk more about your background. Okay. Thanks a lot. Sure. I'm very happy to be here. For those of you who don't know, AAPG is the American Association of Petroleum Geologists. And as one of the distinguished lecturers, I have been sponsored for presentations in American universities. I've had a tour in Europe, Africa, um, Central Asia, and other places, talking about the effect that climate change will have on the fossil fuel industry. Um, as was mentioned, my name is, is Ray Leonard. I graduated with a Bachelor of Science from the University of Arizona in 1975. Um, I got a master's degree in petroleum geology from the University of Texas at Austin in 1977, and then I had a 40-year uh, career in the, in the oil and gas industry. Um, and I currently have a consulting company that I formed two years ago called Anglo Eurasia, which is um, our, our job is to consult with companies and countries on what will they look like in the future as climate change moves us to a low carbon world. What does that mean for the fossil fuel industry? And a lot of com countries and companies say one thing up front, but when the door is closed, they worry and, and the conversation is, is a little bit different. And so um, my company helps advise them on the paths that they should take. Um, so the question is, how, how did I get to this point? And like many life stories, it's, it's not exactly a, a straight line. Um, I grew up in upstate New York, and I was an astronomy nut. I loved astronomy. I had my little telescope, and in the very few days when you actually got a clear sky in upstate New York, I was, I was out there in the winter and the summer. And so it was natural for me to want to go to the University of Arizona and study astronomy. And so that's the way I started. And then near the end of my sophomore year, something happened that had nothing to do with academics. Um, I had a girlfriend who fell in love, and um, uh, we got more serious than both sets of parents thought we should. Um, her, her parents forbid her to see me, and at that point in time, we decided to elope. Um, piled up her trunk in my little Datsun and hid to the Nevada border and got married in state line Nevada. And at that point, both parents cut us off without a cent because if you're old enough to get married, go at it, you're on your own. So we came back to the University of Arizona and got work study jobs and I decided that um, it was probably more profitable in life to be a professional geologist and amateur astronomer rather than the reverse. So I moved changed my major to geology. Um, George Davis was um, the person who helped persuade me to do that. And if you've ever met George Davis, you know he's very persuasive. <laughs> and so I, I, and the other thing that happened, and this is where luck comes into it, is this was in 1973, and two months after this happened was the Arab oil embargo. The price of oil increased by 400%, and all of a sudden petroleum geologists were in demand. And I had a 40-year career in the petroleum industry. Um, the first 20 years were with the company Amoco. Um, I gradually rose in the system and eventually was the vice president of resource acquisitions. And then as they were about to be taken over by British Petroleum, I quit, went off on my own, um, was an executive with the Kazakhstan company, then the Russian oil company, Yukos, then the Hungarian national oil company, and the Kuwait national company. And um, finally, my last job was as the CEO of Hyperdynamics, which was a deep water driller in West Africa. Um, I spent 30 years living overseas, um, and um, it, was, it was the most interesting career.
story or imaginable. I can't. Um, I, I would recommend it to anybody in the international petroleum industry. However, I finished that, turned 65 in 2017, two years ago, um, and decided to move in a different direction because I always had been interested in what was going on in the industry at large and um, also climate change. And so I got into the field of climate change, did a lot of research because I had always done a lot of research and it was just part of what, what I like to do. And I came to an understanding that this was something that was going to fundamentally change, uh, change, change the industry. And so with the contacts that I had made over the years um, in, in the oil and gas industry, um, I was able to establish my consultancy company and it's, it's, really, it's really taken off. There's actually more, more business than I can handle in terms of countries and companies that are interested in trying to figure out, well, what do we do now given, uh, given what's happening in climate change? But what I'd like to talk to you today about is a little bit different than most of my, um, uh, most of my lectures because the core for climate change is actually geology. There are a number of reasons for that, which I, I think will help, um, which you'll see as you go through this talk. The other point that's interesting is astronomy plays a role in climate change too. And my undergraduate studies in astronomy have actually helped me to, um, to understand that. So what I'd like to do now is, is give you a part of my uh, presentation, which really focuses on the science of geology and how it affects climate change. I believe that as a profession, um, obviously geology it, it plays a serious role in terms of working in the fossil fuel industry, but I also believe that climate change is going to be a major place where um, people who have geoscience expertise um, would be needed. The first point I'd like to make is that climate change has been a constant throughout history. This is nothing new. And the slide, you can see the scale changes from hundreds of millions to tens of millions to millions to hundreds of thousands of years. But the point is that, that for example, over the past 300 million years, temperatures have varied by about 20 degrees centigrade or 50 degrees, um, uh, 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And, um, 300 million years ago, it was an extremely cold period. Then just 50 million years later, it was a much hotter period, 10 degrees centigrade over the present. And 50 million years ago was perhaps the hottest time in, in Earth's history. And then since then, it's all been downhill, getting colder and colder. And the last few million years have been as cold as it's been in the entire Earth's history. The Antarctic ice cap um, started about 30 million years ago. The Arctic polar cap three million years ago. And this is the only time in Earth's history when you've actually had two ice caps at the North and the South, on the South Pole. Another point that's interesting is when we talk about climate change, you can see that even the most pessimistic scenario, which is the increase of four degrees centigrade, is far less than the amount of temperature increase that you had in the early part of the, um, of the Cenozoic. So, Life isn't going to end with these dire predictions here. It's going to be different, but it's it's the people who say, well, in 15 years, all Earth is going to end if we don't do something. That's not um, that's not true. Talk about CO2 as um, as the worst as the main influence for climate change. That's true, but it's just one of a number of factors: um, plate tectonics, volcanic activity, solar radiation ocean currents, air currents, and finally atmospheric competition, or composition. The first point is plate tectonics have a lot to do with the way the climate is. For example, 300 million years ago, a lot of the continents were clustered around the South Pole, and you had the world's largest glacier, over 12 million square um, kilometers. Um, and as you saw from the previous slide, the world's temperature was six degrees centigrade or more than 10 degrees Fahrenheit below where it is now. In just 50 million years, those continents 
had managed to migrate up. So that they basically went across the equator and they went from pole to pole. So you didn't have ocean currents that went around the world. And so as a result, the heat in this equatorial zone was such that the temperatures here were up to 30 degrees warmer than they are at the present. And this was one of the warmest times of uh, history. Um, the key point in, in the Cenozoic was opening of the Drake Passage about 35 million years ago, which allowed an Antarctic current to flow around, around the globe and separated Antarctic and an extremely cold continent. And then about 3 million years ago, it got cold enough so that you had an, um, an Arctic polar cap. And as I said before, this was the first time that you had two polar caps. So the study of plate tectonics is, is a key to the study of climates. The other thing that's important, a second thing that's important is volcanic activity because um, in volcanic activity, massive amounts of carbon dioxide is, um, is pumped into the air. And about 50 million years ago, you had spreading centers um, that uh, far beyond what you have today. You were separating North America and Eurasia through two set centers and were separating Antarctica and Australia. You were opening up India and Madagascar. And so you had several orders of magnitude more in volcanics pouring CO2 into the atmosphere, creating a climate that was actually um, the hottest that we've been able to record uh, on the planet. So volcanic activity is another factor. Now, interestingly, separate volcanoes can pour so much ash into the atmosphere that for a period of a few months at least, they depress the temperatures. And so, um, for example, over the past 200 years, you've had five major volcanic explosions. Krakatoa is one you've probably all heard about. It. And the Earth's temperature dropped by about three tenths of a degree, but only for a few months. So within two years, it was back up to normal. And El Chacon and Pintabo are the two that, that are, are the, the nearest to the present. And interestingly, that wasn't enough CO2 to affect the curve of CO2 in, into the atmosphere. So in the short term, individual volcanoes may slightly depress the temperature. Um, but the, the difference between these individual volcanoes and whole trends of hundreds of kilometers long with continuous volcanoes, which you have in the Paleocene, are two different factors. Now we come a little bit to astronomy here. And um, the, the, the thing that I think a lot of people don't appreciate is, is some of the things that we think are constants are not exactly constants, such as you learn in science that the Earth um, is 93 million miles from the sun, and it has a circular orbit. Not exactly. It, it varies from an elliptical orbit that goes from 90 to 96 million miles to a circular orbit, and it's a cycle of about 100,000 years where it goes from the elliptical to the circular. Also, you learn that the Earth has a 23 degree tilt. Well, not exactly. It varies from 22 to 24 and a half, and that's over about a 40,000 year cycle. The other thing is that the Earth's axis wobbles, and that is another, um, another about 30,000 year cycle. So you have all of these three cycles. Now, if the Earth's land and sea was um, uniformly distributed, that wouldn't make much difference. But the thing is that the land absorbs heat from the sun a lot more than, um, than the water, and it heats up a lot faster, which we see later. And because um, about 60% um, of the land area is situated in the northern hemisphere between 15 and 65 degrees, at least during the last few million years, the difference in terms of the tilt and in terms of the eccentricity makes a difference on the climate. So when you have the maximum tilt and this land area is closest to the sun during the 90 million distance from the sun as compared to the 96, it gets hotter. And when the reverse happens, it gets colder. So what you've got is these cycles where you go from glaciation, where it's really cold, to intercycles where it's warm. Cold, warm, cold, warm. And these three all don't always line up together. So everything happens perfectly. It gets really warm. Um, 
And when they don't exactly line up, it doesn't get as warm, but, but the interglacial period lasts a little bit longer. And we know this from the ice cores um, from Antarctica and from a lesser sense in Greenland. And what we are right now is in an interglacial cycle. And if we weren't messing up the atmosphere with other reasons, in another two or 3,000 years, we'd be going back down into another glacial cycle. Now, these are called the Milankovic cycles um, from a Czech astronomer who figured this out. Um, another thing is that the amount of solar radiation we get in the short term varies um, on 22-year cycles. Um, and it varies by about one and a half percent. And it goes up and down and up and down like a sine curve going, going right here. And when everything else is, is kind of normalized, it's about a quarter of a degree centigrade or about seven tenths of a degree Fahrenheit difference between the temperatures you get at the top and the temperatures you get at the bottom. Now, the reason, the way we could calculate this before was by sunspots. We have a lot of sunspots. It's the top of the cycle, and we have fewer sunspots. It's the bottom. And since the invention of the telescope, people could calculate that. And then once we had satellites, um, over the um, over the atmosphere, they verified that. And what's interesting is that the solar radiation is not constant. You had about a seventy year period in which you had no sunspots, and you had um, less solar radiation. And that time is known in Europe at least as the Little Ice Age. The temperatures were about five or ten degrees cooler, um, and that was because you had less solar radiation. We also had a 20-year period at the beginning of the 1800s when it was lower called the Dalton Minimum. Um, and, and that was the coldest time in the past 200 years, right, right here. So we're currently here, and, and actually the, um, uh, the cycles have been getting a little bit less. So if we weren't doing this thing with the CO2 um, in the atmosphere, it actually would have been starting to get a little bit cooler. Another factor is the ocean currents. Um, the, this slide summarizes the conveyor belt uh, of the ocean currents, which transfers a lot of the heat from the equator to the poles and, and back again. Now, a, a serious um, shift in, in the temperatures that happens every few years is the El Nino current, which is a warming of the, of the Pacific current. And this is just a, a a measurement of the El Nino over the years, and this is the, the El Nino and this is the La Nina, which is the opposite of cooling. And for a number of climatic reasons, the El Nino is associated with warm temperatures and, um, and a hotter climate. And what's interesting is that as the ocean is gradually warming, um, you've had three very strong El Ninos in 1984, in, in 1998, and in 2016 three warmest El Ninos that they've, um, that they've ever reported, although the, the quality of the recordings in the 19th century is, of course, a little more suspect. But even so, the El Nino seems to be, seems to be getting stronger. Another key to the, to the uh, climate is the air circulation. Now, in the polar regions, you've got very cold air, and of course, warmer air in the temperate, and you have something called the jet stream which separates the two and keeps the Arctic climate from the more temperate climate. And as you'll see later, one of the things that's happening is the Arctic is warming a lot faster than the temperate areas. As a matter of fact, three times as fast. So what's happening is the temperature differential is getting smaller. And this is weakening, which is creating wobbles. And that means that warm fronts that normally would not get up to the high latitudes are being able to make it to the north. And then sometimes, actually, extreme cold fronts that would never go south of the Arctic are being able to make it to the south. Um, another fact, which I'll talk about later, is because of the warm temperatures, the North Polar Cap is, is disappearing. As a matter of fact, by, um, by mid-century during the summer, um, the Northern Polar Cap is almost going to be gone. So let's move now to the atmosphere. And there are three greenhouse gases, uh, prominent greenhouse gases. Carbon dioxide, which forms 76% of the greenhouse gases, of which 80% comes from fossil fuels, 
and only 20% comes from, from natural forces. Methane, 16%, of which maybe 70% comes from natural forces, and 30% from fossil fuels. And nitrous oxide, 6%, of which only 10% comes from fossil fuels. Now, we can calculate how much carbon dioxide was in the atmosphere from geochemistry, sedimentology, and paleontology. And this is very much a, a, a geologic, um, geologic study. Um, not surprisingly, during the Carboniferous glaciation period, the CO2 level is about what it is today. Um, during the Permo Triassic, it spiked to something on the order of 1,500 parts per million, which is about four times what it is, is today. And, and you know, some people have said, well, CO2 is good for plants, so a lot of CO2 it must be wonderful. Well, 90% of the species on Earth became extinct at that point, so it's not so wonderful. Um, during the Cretaceous, the CO2 level is about 800 parts per million. It dropped at the end of the Cretaceous, but then in the Paleocene and Eocene, which is that very warm period, it's about 800 parts per million. Then with the opening of the Drake Passage and the cooling, it dropped to about 400 parts per million. And then about two to three million years ago, it dropped to the current level of between 180 during glaciation and 280 during the, um, uh, the warmer periods. And what's happened is, is just during the last 150 years, it's gone from about 280 to 415. So in other words, we're beyond the level in which the Arctic ice cap formed. And at the pace we're going, it's gonna hit 500 by, um, uh, by 2050. And by the latter part of the century, we're gonna be at levels that we haven't been since 30 million years ago. So this is, is not business as usual. And just to, just to show you, this is what the graph looks like. Uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, the latest reading is about 415, and the process is, is accelerating. So what's happening? What, why is the CO2 going up? Well, this slide shows the amount of CO2 that was pumped in the atmosphere due to fossil fuels. And as you can see, right around 1945 or 1950, it just took off and exploded. This was the industrial expansion of the US, Europe, USSR, and Japan. Who's doing it? Um, the US and the EU were by far the most in the 1970s, 1980s. The EU dropped, the US is starting to drop, but, but look at China. China puts out as much CO2 as the EU and Europe put together. India is just, is just starting its, its rise. And the correlation between CO2 in the atmosphere and temperature, if you can't see a correlation between those two, this curve and, and the temperature, then the only excuse is, well, maybe you don't know how to read your brain. <laughs> Unfortunately, there are some people in high places who seem to have that problem. Um, the, the fact that it's accelerating is scary. Um, this shows that from 1960 to 1980, the increase was averaging one part per million per year. From 1980 to 2000, one and a half parts per million. From 2000 to 2010, two parts per million. And this decade, three parts per million. And as a matter of fact, this past year has been four parts per million. So this is, the whole process is accelerating. Now, the second greenhouse gas is methane which is actually far more potent than CO2, molecule for molecule. It's 80 times more in the short term, but 25 times in the long term. The reason for that is a lot of the, CO, the methane dissolves in the atmosphere and gradually gets less and less. That's the good news. The bad news is a lot of it turns into CO2. Um, but the methane concentrations have increased almost double the rate of CO2 since the Industrial Revolution, so that even the methane was 10% of greenhouse gases 200 years ago, now it's 16%, and it's providing 25% of, of the increase. Um, the amount of methane increase, you notice this kind of strange hook at the end, it was increasing, then it flattened out for about 10 years, and now it's starting to increase again. And there's a lot of controversy about this, but the increase here is felt by a lot of people to be the melting of the permafrost. And one of the reasons for that is the, the increased methane seems to be coming 
from far northern latitudes, number one. And number two is it seems to be lower C13 isotope levels, which is biogenic methane rather than methane that comes from the use of fossil fuels. And what happens is methane molecules are very small, and so they naturally come up from the subsurface and go into the atmosphere, except in the permafrost where ice caps it. And you've got a lot of areas that have been covered by permafrost for 10, 20, 30, 40,000 years. When they melt, that methane that's been accumulated under them just pops up. And this slide shows the methane in, in the air at point at, at Barrow, Alaska, at a point where the permafrost melted, where the methane amount increased by 25%, where it finally did melt. So this is something that it really is, is important. So you put all these pieces together, and as you notice, geology and astronomy come into each, each piece of it. And what's been happening is well, temperatures have been gradually rising in the background, but it hasn't been as though they've been up by 0.1% year after year, year after year, up and down, up and down. And there are a couple of reasons for that, and that's because there are a number of factors, and the answer is not as, as simple. People like it to be simple, but it, it is what it is. Now, um, a lot of the years when you break your temperature records are right at the solar maximum which is not surprising. Um, the other times when you break your records are at your El Nino years. So what happens when you hit a solar maximum and an El Nino the temperature literally goes through the roof. We're right now at a solar minimum. Um, we're going to get up to another solar maximum sometime in about three or four years from now. And when you hit an El Nino and a solar maximum there, the temperature is going to break through. So what's happened in 2019? Um, the solar cycle is at the minimum. The El Nino current has been very weak, so you ought to think, well, maybe this year wasn't so bad. Wrong. Um, 2019 has been the second warmest year on record, at least through the records through September. This is just um, the, the temperature through September here's 2019. Um, which is just short of 2016, which is the warmest year. And most of the warmth has come in polar regions, West Antarctica and, and the Arctic. So as a result, the amount of ice in the summer in the Arctic has been the second lowest ever, ever recorded. So climate change is happening in three phases. The, the first phase um, was from 1945 to 1980, in which the CO2 was rising, but the temperatures weren't rising. It was as though the Earth could absorb a certain amount of punishment without, um, without showing anything. Um, and then in 1980, the temperatures started to rise. But interestingly, they were rising twice as fast on land as they were in the ocean. And they were rising twice as fast in the Arctic as they were on land. You see, it goes up to about 1.5. In the same time zone, as in the same time period, the Arctic is rising three degrees. So what's happened is, is in just a little over 30 years, most of the multi-year ice in the Arctic is melted. So, um, so and multi-year ice means ice that, uh, single-year ice means ice that melted by September. By, so by the end of the summer, the only ice that's left ice here. So by the middle of the century, by 2050 or so, the only ice you're going to have in the summer in the Arctic is just a little bit here on the north edge of Greenland. The other thing that's happened is that, as one would expect from the melting of glaciers, Greenland, and our Antarctic ice, sea level rise is increasing at, at a pretty constant rate. Of every 15 years, the rate of sea level rise increases by 15%, by 50%, so doubles every 30 years. And if that continues, then you're going to have a sea level rise of about two meters by the end of the century. Now, after 2000, what you're having is, is what is called cascading impacts or compound effects, which is actually common sense. It's where one effect hits another, and that's why the whole process is accelerating. For example, snow reflects sunlight. So with warming temperatures, the amount of land covered by snow is, is reduced. So um, just in this century, about 10% of the area was covered 
by snow is no longer covered by snow, so the more heat, the more it is absorbed, and the disappearing north polar cap will increase that effect. Um, as I mentioned before, when the permafrost melts, you get large pulses of methane. The permafrost covers 20% of the world's land area. Since 2000, 15% of that is melted, about 2030, 25%. Um, if the current trends continue by 2060, it'll reach 50%. The currents um, on the world gradually take the increased heat in the, in the oceans and they move it to the southern, um, the southern oceans. And where that hurts is that a lot of the ice sheets off Antarctica um, are, are below sea level where they get the continent. This is, this is the baseline, this is the ice sheet. And so this warm water, particularly in West Antarctica, is undercutting the ice sheets. Warmer temperature actually is also warming the climate in Antarctica, so in West Antarctica, the temperature is rising five times the global average. The other factor, the combination of lack of snow cover, rising temperatures, and drought result in widespread summer Arctic fires in Siberia and North America. This just shows in July satellite photos of uh, fires in Canada, Alaska, and Siberia. There's been all this publicity about the fires in Antarctica, the fires in Antarctica uh, I mean, the fires in, in the Amazon. The fires in the Amazon aren't nearly as big as the fires in Siberia. Um, so it's just a case of uh, it's easier to pick Brazil, I guess, than it is to pick Russia. So, Russia to yeah. so we come now to phase three, which is a tipping point. Steady changes may be replaced by a large scale change in the climate system. In other words, point of no return. And it used to be thought of as a kind of a fantasy, but as things accelerate, we're getting closer and closer to these things possibly actually happening. And the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Control, has put out a report that's just out actually this month in which the last chapter talks about these potential living. Um, tipping points. And these are the four that have the highest chance of possibly happening. Changes in ocean circulation patterns, breaking off of major ice sheets, the breakdown of the jet stream, or the breakdown in the marine ecosystem. Now, exactly when you hit that point, as many different climate scientists you talk to, you get, you get different answers. We may be able to avoid it if we can significantly reduce CO2 emissions. Um, or at least delay it to give us time to prepare. Um, the first point is, is ocean currents, and just as different points in the land are warming more than others, um, different points in the ocean are also warming more than others, and the area that's most stressed is the Atlantic margin. You've got a huge hot spot off the east coast, then you've got a cold spot south of Greenland, which is due to all the melting water from, from the glacier, and then a hot spot up in the North Atlantic. So this current that's trying to make it through here as it did before is under stress. It's already weakening and it's on the verge of collapse. Um, the El Nino current, as I've mentioned, is getting warmer and warmer. So what is the practical effect? If this current weakens and, and is actually, um, um, it, it's more likely to gradually weaken than just suddenly disappear like it did in the day after tomorrow. Um, it, it will gradually weaken, but what will happen is increased storms in the North Atlantic, or, uh, uh, redu reduction in marine productivity, and Northern Europe gets a lot colder and a lot drier. Um, England is at 50 degrees latitude, the same as Labrador. If you go to spend winter in Labrador, it's nothing like the winter in England. Um, so, uh, ironically, the danger to England is it could get. A stronger El Nino means uh, hot and dry for the southern U.S. and, and northern South America and, and also East Asia. The 2016 year that broke all the temperature records, you get that again and it will break it at, um, at another level. Um, ice sheets. Um, as I mentioned before, Antarctica is going to get five times the temperature of, of the rest of the planet. And so you not only have the warm oceans undercutting the glaciers there, but it's melting on top too. And breaking off of the West Ant 
our brother Aishi is, is a real warrior. As a matter of fact, that has happened in the past. Um, the Greenland Aishi, um, the average usually 10% of the area of Greenland melts in, in June and August, 15% in July. Last summer, during one period, we did 40% in June and 65% in July. So the amount of ice melting off Greenland has steadily increased. As you can see in the past, we usually had about a balance in terms of the amount of new snow versus the amount of melting, but that's gone. And every year, it's instead of getting worse. Is the breaking off of an ice sheet something that, that is a fantasy or is it actually happening? Here we go back to geology and sedimentology. And at the end of the last glacial period, sea level rose by 80 meters in just 8,000 years, which is an average of one meter every century. But it didn't go in a straight line. We had one time, it was called Meltwater Pulse 1A, in which it averaged 26 to 53 millimeters per year, and, and it, it, a peak was 50 millimeters per year, which is one meter every 20 years. Um, and why did it do that? Because a chunk of the West Antarctica ice shelf broke off and went into the ocean and, and melted. And that could happen again. So, uh, again, this is not a fantasy. This actually happened about 14,000 years ago. Um, weakening of the jet stream due to the fact that it's warming a lot more here in the north than it is in the temperate zone. You've seen this before. And so, you know, what would this look like? Well, we actually saw this happen last summer, um, where you had, this is a, um, from, from NASA, uh, of the, um, the jet stream. It's hard to see here, but this is Africa right here. And this is Western Europe. And what happened is the front Sahara-like weather drifted north and drifted over Western Europe. You had temperatures of 105 degrees in Paris, 100 degrees in London. Um, you basically had Sahara weather in Western Europe. Europe, the first time we broke all the temperature record. That's going to be the new normal. But what was even stranger was it then drifted up and ended up over Greenland. And if you remember from this slide, we suddenly had 65% of the Greenland ice cap melt. That's, that's what happened. Um, so that's why I'm saying that, that different events that are happening here are affecting things that are happening here. And, and that's why the whole process is, is accelerating. The final potential collapse, and none of these four things are exclusive. I mean, have any one of the four, and, and having one doesn't especially cut off having the others, is that 30% of the 30% um, of the extra CO2 you have um, is absorbed by the ocean. So the ocean is getting more acidic. It's already 30% more acidic than it was last century. And as it gets more acidic, it affects the marine life. And that's one of the reasons why half of the world's coral reefs are now, are now gone. The other thing is you get these heat waves in the ocean that cause mass dying. And as the temperature increases, the probability of these heat waves also, also increase. Now, the world uses, um, uh, as, as we go back here, about 20% of all protein consumed by the humans come from marine life, which rises to over 50% in coastal areas. And the increased demand is 3% every year. So it means 3% more marine life every, um, every year. Um, and the calculations are that as the ocean warms, the amount of biomass is, is decreasing. Um, and that means the amount of marine catch is also going to be increasing. So we've got a problem here in that the amount we're supposed to be taking is going to be increasing by 3% every year, whereas the, the catch potential is, is reducing. And, and this, is, uh, this is moving in a gradual. If you have heat waves that cause mass dying, it can happen even faster. And again, this is not something that is random across the globe. In some places, it will be worse than others, predominantly. In equatorial area. It actually gets a little better in the Arctic because you've got places that are not covered by ice, but but volumetrically this is a lot less than the amount you're using, um, using here. So based on all this, what is the likely future? And the IPCC has
put together a number of different scenarios. Um, the um, best scenario, which is to try to get things down to two degrees increase, is not going to happen. It means you've got to stop using fossil fuel right now. And unfortunately, the world is not going to stop using fossil fuel right now. This isn't going to happen. Now, if it went as as it's gone in the 20th century so far, you've got the worst case scenario, and that's also not going to happen. Fortunately, some areas like the EU have, have started to cut down. Um, so really what you're left with are your two intermediate scenarios. One is we can somehow flatten the amount of CO2 emissions while we're building up our renewables and try to, uh, by 2040 or 2050, start to reduce our emission levels. Or RCP6, which is going to end up with a three and a half degree increase eventually, is the path that we're um, that we're likely on right now, unless we do some changes. Now, this is where it gets a little painful because the Paris Climate Agreement, well, well meaning, is, is seriously flawed. Um, it talks about trying to get things down to two degrees, but if you take a look at the actual pledges that the countries make, you're not even going to come close to that. Um, you're going to increase your emissions by another 20% by 2030, and then we're supposed to just stop. And, and that's that's just not going to happen. It, it, it's unrealistic. There's no enforcement mechanisms, no penalties for um, uh, for failure. And, and this chart just shows this is where you are based on your current policies. You can go anywhere from 3.1 to 3.7 degrees increase. Um, even if they abided by the Paris Climate Accord, which some major nations like the, the U.S., Australia, Brazil, Russia are, are not uh, saying they're not going to do that. Even that would only be about three degrees. Um, there was an IPCC report, and they weren't allowed to say in the executive summary that the Paris Accord doesn't do what it's supposed to do. They had to bury it in about page 17 in these small letters. But, um, that's the problem. If we're going to do something, it's going to have to be something a lot stronger than the Paris Accord. So, Finally, and let me, this is, if I was presenting to industry, which I am, this is just the start of another big part of the presentation. The key here is that different fossil fuels emit different amounts of greenhouse gases per unit of energy. And this just shows it in, in a chart that's easy to compare. It's kilograms of CO2 per, per barrel of, of crude. And what it shows, in many charts you'll have three points, coal, gas, oil in the middle. And in reality, there's, there's a continuum from natural gas to coal, this extra heavy oil like it, or the tar sands, secondary and tertiary recovery oil, conventional oil, and the light oil, and, um, and, and the natural gas. And the way we can get out of this realistically is to shift from using the heavier hydrocarbons to at least in a transitional phase over the next 20, 30 years using the light hydrocarbons. And, and that is something that actually could be done if, if we have the, um, the will to do it. And when you work out the numbers, what it means you have to do is you've got to cut coal consumption in half by 2040 and again in half by 2060. You've got to um, have oil, which is now just around 100 million barrels a day, peak at 110 million barrels a day and plateau, and then start to drop with an increasing fraction of ultra light oil, and then use natural gas to basically fill the gap. And meanwhile, increase your um, solar and wind energy renewables by the 7 to 8 percent per year that we're doing right now. And you can actually get to the RCP 4.5 scenario if you do that. So that's that's what I go around trying to preach to people to, and, and it's, a, it's a doable way. So it's not an ideal solution, but it's the best realistic solution. That Finally, in closing, what I want to talk about here is geology and climate change. Because geoscientists are the historians of the Earth's past. And they have to play a crucial role in, address, in addressing climate change, which I believe is the great challenge in the 21st century. And I have three major reasons, and you can probably find more than that, but 
many of the elements that document climate change are identified in utilizing the concepts and tools of the geologic and geophysics science. Almost everything you do in your studies, you can step back and say, this is relating to understanding climate change. The second point is the major climate shifts that pose the potential economic and humanitarian crises from climate change can be clearly documented in the geologic history. The rapid sea level rise, the, um, the mass extinctions, um, the dramatic changes in climate, you can all document this in the geologic past. And you can help explain to the public at large that these things are not are not fantasies. Um, they actually happened in the past and can happen again and, and show them. And the third point is that fossil fuels account for more than 80% of produced energy. Um, the shift to a lower carbon economy has got to come with cooperation and support from the fossil fuel industry. So having professionals in the fossil fuel industry who understand climate change can help move companies in the right direction is again something that, that needs to be happening. So you know, I, and, and you know, the closing thought here is if we do not deal with reality, reality will deal with us. Climate change is coming. So as potential geoscientists, you know, what, what I can tell you, really show by example, is, is when I was coming out of school a little over 40 years ago, um, you had the oil, Arab oil embargo, and prices were going up, and, really needed petroleum geoscientists to find more energy and help sort the world out. Um, it's a different world now, and climate change is, is the great challenge of the 21st century. And I think geoscientists are in the front line of, of dealing with it and trying to explain it to the, uh, uh, to the public at large. And, uh, I made a career choice, and it was pretty late in my career. But I made the career choice. The rest of my career was dedicated to try to do that. And I sort of envy you if you're starting off on a few science career. Because I think this is going to be a core of what you do and the most need to be done. So um, that tells you who I am and what I feel about the science of archaeology. So with that, I thank you for listening, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. <laughs> If, uh, you know, the effects of climate change are going to be kind of drastic in our time, you know, our lifespan, what sort of capacity are geosciences going to, like, what kind of job are they going to be taking in the next 50 years to deal with climate change? Well, I see, I see three different potential paths. One path is obviously with the fossil fuel industry, and, and I believe that the fossil fuel industry behind the scenes is, is understanding um, what what has to happen. Um, they're going to have to be shifting from the heavy hydrocarbons to the light hydrocarbons is the only realistic way going forward. So this doesn't mean the end of the fossil fuel industry. I would say if you're a coal geologist, better find a new profession. But if you're looking to um, to basically produce oil, the light hydrocarbon, natural gas, and all the oil. I think for the next generation, 20 or 30 years, that's going to be the workforce of, um, of hydrocarbon. So I, I do believe there's still a major role in the fossil fuel industry. So that's, that's one direction. Um, a, a second direction is in terms of being able to explain the climate change to, to the public at large, and that's working with state governments and um, research institutions and um, um, you know public affairs. Because, as I said before, everything that's happening has happened before, and it's geologists who will be able to show and be able to demonstrate that. Because we need to build public support to make the changes. That, that are needed. Um, the third piece is the um, is basically dealing with um, 
the effects of climate change. Because climate change is going to uh, is going to affect you know geologically the, the floodplains where we put things. Also, the, the whole science of carbon sequestration. Uh, for example, if you're going to try to take the huge amounts of CO2 that we have now and put them in the subsurface, that means finding reservoirs, finding sandstone reservoirs, and putting them to velocity permeability. There's also a geologic element of what do you do with all the CO2 um, that, that we've done. So um, that's, a, that's a private industry. A sort of job. Um, there's also, from the standpoint of a predictive model on climate change, from from the insurance industry to the building industry, everybody is trying to predict what it's going to look like in, in the future because um, um, it, it'll drastically affect their business models and what they do. And again, geologists are at the core of that study. So uh, I see a whole wide range of potential for geoscientists who study climate change. Just just opening up. The same as you know, opening up for, for IT people, for example. Um, so it's it's an exciting time to be in, um, in climate change. Just as when the Arab oil embargo started and suddenly oil prices quadrupled, it was an exciting time to be in, in control of geology. So that's those are the three different broad areas that, that I see in the board. I have a daughter who has a geosciences and a master's degree. And she did her research on the graduate level on lake things, looking at paleo plants, essentially doing a bunch of laboratory research over the board. I really tried to, to see if there was a way to use that information to forecast. Match potential patterns for today versus in the era that she was looking at from this point. And she's now working for the um, New Mexico Bureau of Geology. And part of her job is public outreach. And so at least half of her, her position there as a research scientist is to communicate as much as she can regarding what's happening in the perspective climate as well as other aspects of the. Um, what the New Mexico Bureau of Geology does in terms of other projects as well. But that public outreach piece is really important. And, and, and you just can to, get there. Just to emphasize, and I think I tried to make sense of this, this whole process of accelerating. People made a prediction in 2000, the way it would be in 2010. They vastly underestimated. In 2010, they predicted in 2013. They underestimated it. I believe that things will go a lot faster. So the need for people who understand this is um, going to increase. Right. I just, I just want to add another aspect to that. Is I am a paleoclimatologist, and so a former uh, lab mate of mine, uh, another industry that's hugely due to climate change that geosciences can really contribute to, it's actually something I've never heard of until my lab mate actually got a job there, is the reinsurance industry. Yep. So the reinsurance industry is an entire industry that insures insurance companies. So think about it this way. Think about it this way. So if a hurricane Katrina happens, all of this part of uh, New Orleans is going on water and people who have house insurance, uh, a Geico or a, a you know, state farm, they're not going to be able to handle that much, right? So what they do is they insure themselves. And these are multi-billion dollar companies that actually... Uh, use geologists, geoscientists uh, like myself and, and my lab mates who, who can tell them what are the storm recurrences? What are the, uh, how is the land subsiding? How frequent are these things going to happen? And guess what? The, the way that the premiums are set up for the reinsurance companies is based on geosciences. And this is a, this is a huge industry. And so, in fact, uh, you know, they, they were on the climate change train because they have to be. Uh, you know, decades ago. So this is just another aspect of, of the sort of acceleration that Ray is talking about. Just, just a, the, the rain out there reminds me, it's an interesting point, but one of the big hot spots in the ocean is off Baja, California. And what's been happening is the Pacific cyclones, usually 
it's actually has to go up and just keep further and further and further north. And that warm water, of course, is, is helping that to happen. And you know, the worry is that they get so far north that if they come up to this point, they can come here. And, you know, think of what Tucson would be like if you got the remnants of a tropical cyclone hitting here and getting 10 inches or 15 inches of rain. So, so Ray, um, at this point, what suggestions would you have for undergraduates in terms of coursework, internships, or any kind of steps that you would recommend that they take if this is the kind of thing they might be interested in? But one thing that, that Arizona is really doing a lot of the past, um, just during the time that I've been on the board, is really building up a, a powerful um, climate change aspect of the geology department. We've got several world-class specialists, including one Jessica Tierney, who's a member of the IPCC, the International Panel on, on Climate Control. So um, I don't I don't know the specific coursework lists, right. but I do believe there's opportunities as a um, in the junior and senior year to um, really be able to take courses from world-class experts. One of the universities that we are the department geology department, sir. Okay. You see the shift from heavy heavy oil to sort of lighter hydrocarbons happening without imposition of a regulatory framework and governance? Um, the problem is some companies are thinking ahead and are starting to do it without it. And other companies are not. I, I give a presentation and I show the companies in the right direction. Shell, for example, is rapidly moving there, divesting of all the heavy oil and increasing the proportion of gas. And then there are others that are going in the opposite direction, distracting the heads of oil they fit. Um, so that's, that's part of what I do, is, is the tabulations with the different companies to show which ones are moving in what I think in the right direction. Some just seem to have a longer vision than ours. Yeah. Yeah, I just had a list of questions. And it's like some companies are going in the wrong direction. They usually have your oil. Yeah. Do you think they're doing that just before there's a lot more strict regulation on that? Well, so they're, they're just trying to exploit that before. Part of the problem is our national government is going in the wrong direction. <laughs> and they're taking advantage of, of that um, of that gap. They're taking the short term benefits. I think it's worth stating, I, I do a lot of work for the power industry, and I think similar to the, the oil and gas industry, they're noticing these economic shifts, and I mean, they're in the business to make So, if they're getting cheaper, uh, if they can get energy cheaper and better and more sustainably, and it has a forward look for them, that they can they can sell to their investors and then they say we have a long term plan. Then it's going to be the direction it goes. So what I've noticed is in spite of interesting <laughs> in spite of our current administration and some of the other directions near the top, we're seeing even in Arizona coal fired power plants are shutting down and they're moving more towards gas and just it's just happening. And so I think we can all encourage you and I think this public um Sort of communication aspect of the scientists is huge that it's rolled in fire. They just announced that the whole fire plant is shut down. Yeah. And it's all based on costs. Yeah. Despite the economics. And the other large one is the state Troy power plant that already worked for the whole entire side there. It's not the problem. 